So with that slight diversion, uh, so we have a, a tools project that depends a lot on other system components and has a small development team. And although we are fairly robust to regressions causing fatal errors because uh, system tap infamously depends on internal kernel interfaces that uh, the kernel provides no guarantees of stability for. Uh, we've engineered around that to try and fail gracefully uh, as much of the time as possible. Uh, but for various functionality, uh, non-fatal degradations tend to creep in over time. Uh, the same with working with debug information. Uh, debug information is a fairly uh, loosely uh, maintained area as well. So that's another subject where uh, it's possible to have things change over time. Let's see. So in this talk, I'm going to make the argument for why it's uh, useful not just to set up a CI system, but also to maintain and curate a historical archive of test results. Uh, I'll give an overview of the toolkit I wrote uh, to do just that for our purposes. And I'll give some examples of the types of analysis that you can do if you have historical data, as opposed to just the most recent results from your CI system. So to give an overview of the problem, uh, why would a project want to keep a historical archive of test results? The, I've looked around at uh, projects setting up continuous integration, and the standard blueprint uh, is that you have uh, proposed patches coming to the project, so they're not yet in your project's Git repo. Uh, you automatically test them on something like a set of build bots or a Jenkins server. Uh, you compare to the result to a known good version of the project. Uh, so you assume that a recent version of the project is good enough for your purposes. And you accept or reject the patch based on the results, whether they contain any regressions. Uh, so obviously accepting it just means that you pass it on further to manual patch review. Uh, but at this stage, based on the test results, the accept or reject decision is very basic. If the test suite is complex and large and has test cases on predictable results, uh, then you're probably only using a subset of those uh, for the decision. And you don't really store the uh, build bot test results for over a long period of time. So the systems I've seen generally keep about two months of data. And beyond that, it probably uh, gets to be worryingly large to keep all of those uh, raw test result logs. And this system works great, and it solves a slightly different problem from what we have on our project. Uh, this is great for projects that have a fire hose of incoming patch submissions, and they want to cut down on the maintainer time that's spent on reviewing those. So that in addition to this, can such a system uh, guard against regressions creeping in long term? Uh, well, it could if we assume several things which are unlikely to hold for some projects. First, we assume that we have a very clean and disciplined test suite. Uh, so it doesn't give us spurious failures that don't correspond to serious problems. And it doesn't have non-deterministic test cases that give one result one time you run it and a different result the next. And we assume that the continuous integration the collection of build bots we're using covers all relevant system configurations. So if someone has an exotic hardware architecture or uh, distribution, then whatever regressions their system experiences are going to be left out of this process. And finally, we assume that regressions uh, aren't going to be caused by changes in the underlying operating system or other dependencies. Uh, because those changes aren't being captured by the patch submissions that we're accepting or rejecting. Uh, this may not be true for some projects as they are now. So there's kind of a spectrum. Uh, my vague impression from what I know of all these projects is that GCC, for example, has a very strict and disciplined test suite. Uh, they don't really have non-deterministic test cases, nor do they need to keep them around if any show up. Uh, GDB and system tap are on the opposite extreme because they interact in slightly different ways with uh, underlying operating system features that have very intricate behavior. 
and likewise with debug information. And also the uh, test cases often involve parallel code, which can be set up and end up running unpredictably in terms of the ordering of events. Uh, glibc in terms of engineering efforts and in terms of the need to have uh, some test cases with not the test non-deterministic functionality strikes me as being somewhere in the middle. So for the projects that uh, have very messy and large test suites, it's not going to be feasible to just sit down and fix everything and make the test suite work at the same standard as GCC all in one go. So for that purpose, instead, what I started trying to do for the system top project is to just collect all of the build bot data, uh, put it into a central repository, and then see what type of analysis I can do on it to try and discover what the trends are and what we could focus our attention on. Okay, so just a, a quick check uh, up to now. Hopefully people were able to hear me. All right. Sorry, that initial technical difficulty uh, kept me a bit worried. Okay. Anyways, so continuing uh, with the talk, the toolkit I wrote, I presented on a very initial uh, idea for it about uh, two years ago at GNU Cauldron in Montreal. And the basic idea is still the same. I have our system tap build bots producing uh, Deja GNU test result logs. I parse those and produce them into a slightly more uh, analyzable JSON index, which contains the same information. And I store the test results and JSON index in a Git repo. And what Git gives us is that I don't have to worry about keeping uh, two or more years of logs in one place because these logs are going to be deduplicated with a relatively high compression factor, uh, which holds up as you add more test runs over time. So these test result logs are mostly the same uh, results appearing over and over again. So deduplication is a good compression strategy. Uh, Bunsen also includes a Python library for querying the index test results. And what I'm talking about today is the various analysis that can be used to extract information uh, from the repository using this library. So in order to describe what type of analysis I can do, I have to go into a bit more detail about Bunsen's data model. So every time we invoke our test suite, and put the results into a Bunsen repository. The metadata associated with that is a pair of commit IDs, a description of the system configuration that ran the test, and the list of test cases. So the two commit IDs, and it's important to uh, distinguish those because uh, it's possible to be confused otherwise. First, we have the git commit ID of uh, source code of the actual project we're testing. Uh, now, this is peculiar to system tap because we don't do CI gating. Uh, instead, we're testing commits once they've been committed to our master branch. Uh, this could be replaced by the ID of a submission to a uh, CI system if we're testing patches before they end up in the repository. And we could replace this by any other version data that, that allows us to sort project versions chronologically and figure out which version is based on which other one. Besides this, we have another commit ID, which is the git commit ID of the test result logs in the Bunsen repository. So we have access to the original Deja GNU uh, sum and log files who want to do additional parsing on them. And we can also add auxiliary log files. So for system tap, I find it useful to include uh, a file of system diagnostics and the D message output from the kernel since that uh, can capture information about failures that aren't obvious from the uh, logs from running the actual system tap script. In addition to this, the system configuration is a set of key value pairs. Uh, most commonly, we describe the Linux distribution or other operating system we're testing on and the hardware architecture. But it also makes sense to include versions of dependent components like the kernel, 
uh, or the, in some cases, the C compiler might be relevant if we're looking at uh, something that depends very heavily on the details of how GCC produces dwarf. We might include an LFUTILS version, things like that. In addition, we have the actual data for the individual test cases. So we follow the DejaGNU format of having uh, a relatively small number of large test cases. So these have a name. And within each large test case, we usually have myriad subtests. Uh, so which top level test cases exist within a DejaGNU uh, test suite is fixed and predictable. So if it has 454 cases in the test suite, uh, those same 454 cases are going to be run uh, in every invocation of that test suite. But the subtests tend to present a problem. So the subtest is identified by a string which is not necessarily in many test suites unique or stable or detailed. It's more like a diagnostic message. Uh, so the model we use is that for each uh, top level test, uh, we have the set of passing and failing uh, subtests associated with it. And what we usually care about is the set of failures and comparing which failures exist in that set versus in one test run versus in other test runs of the same test suite. So we see if that set increases, decreases, stays the same. Uh, and we consider that to be our uh, regression. And then we have the outcome, which is pass, fail, and other uh, similar outcome codes defined by DejaGNU. And we have various options for how detailed or compact we want this data to be. Uh, when I set up the system tap, once in repository, I was worried about how much space it would take up. Uh, so I introduced some compression, uh, which consolidates any uh, passing subtests into one entry. Uh, so if we uh, don't have any fails for a particular test case in our test suite, uh, we consider the absence of failure to mean no problem. And we don't bother with uh, keeping detailed index entries of the individual subtests. But other projects may not fit that definition. And it would make sense to store all of the subtests passing or failing individually. So we do include that option. Now, previously when I presented about Bunsen, I described the repository and outlined this format. And I gave as an example of analysis that you might want to do uh, on this repository uh, that you could take any pair of test results and diff them. Uh, so this was modeled on many existing simple and uh, successful utilities for diffing a pair of DejaGNU test results. Uh, but for the type of investigation I was going to do, it actually turned out to be not particularly useful. So if you take a version of your project that has a chaotic test suite designated as known good and diff against it, uh, you don't really get a full picture of what's going on. You don't have a known good version of your project with a clean test suite. Uh, so the baseline you're diffing against has its own problems uh, that you might be end up masking this way. Uh, you might get regressions on configurations that aren't tested as regularly as others, which also creates difficulties for interpreting a diff. And most fatally, regressions can be changed by changes in underlying dependencies. Uh, so to make sense of all of this, we end up needing the entire historical context uh, of, the, of a particular regression and a particular test case. So the way to do that for the starting point, I used an approach that was originally developed by uh, Martin Cermak at my company, uh, which is to take each top level test case in the test suite, uh, take each system configuration, and for each commit in a range that we're interested in, uh, say the previous release up to now, uh, just draw a grid with uh, plus, minus, and question mark depending on whether the test case 
outcome for a given uh, combination of configuration and commit is pass, fail, or was untested. And we output that as a table, one table for each test case. And it looks something like this. Uh, so over from left to right, we have uh, commits with more recent commits on the left and less recent commits on the right. And from top down, we have the different system configurations that we've been testing and we have test results inside cells of the grid. And in this case, we can see that there was a block of four commits that was pushed and it introduced a very clear regression in this test case. So looking through this, we can spot it uh, very quickly in a visual way. Uh, but the problem is that there is 454 of these tables uh, that I have to look at to get a sense of what the state of our test suite has been over the past release. Uh, and that's a lot of scrolling. So to improve this, uh, I took this grid data as the starting point for additional analysis. Uh, so I assembled the grid exactly as shown on the previous slide, uh, with the key being a tuple of uh, test case configuration and project version being tested. And inside the values, I put a set of the test cases uh, in each cell of the grid uh, that were tested on that configuration of factors. Uh, and then I scan these grids in chronological order and try and use the entire history of that row of the grid to decide if a particular change is noteworthy and worth including. And then I create a timeline view based on that. So uh, as a detail, which uh, for time I would go into much detail. So again, the uh, basic starting point for the analysis is a three-dimensional data structure uh, with versions along one dimension, uh, test cases along a different one, and configurations along a third. And building this is slow uh, but tolerable if I use the current Git plus JSON representation as a starting point. Uh, it takes about uh, a minute for uh, one release of system tab project uh, for a longer portion of history. It'll take more than that proportional to the number of commits. Uh, it could probably be improved if by adding uh, a some form of caching layer, uh, but it's not a very high priority. Getting the re analysis result back in a minute uh, is seems relatively fast for me. Now, the crucial part of how this data structure is represented is that uh, when we're analyzing the grid, and I'll come back to the slide where this is visually visible. So our build bot system doesn't really have uh, enough computational resource to uh, test, do enough tests to fill in every cell of this grid uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, so depending on the uh, look of the draw, we may have gaps. And so for analysis, it's important that when we're comparing adjacent results that we can skip smoothly over the gaps. So the data structure includes indexing to make sure that we can find the previous tested version of each uh, test case in each grid cell. So when we're comparing across these two versions, we know that uh, in this block of commits, there was an immediate change. And what we do with the filtering is generally try to uh, cut out uh, periods when the test case was flipping back and forth. So we designate those periods of time as flaky and consider them as uh, during that period of time, the test case was in a consistently unstable state. Uh, so if we have a test case that was consistently passing, uh, then flipping back and forth uh, and then failing or vice versa, then we identify essentially two changes in the test case state as opposed to one individual ch change for each time it flipped back and forth. And 
there's several different ways to display these changes. We can display them by commit and try and figure out uh, what changes were associated with each commit that we made. Uh, and we can uh, instead sort them in chronological order by test case. So at the moment, neither of these analyses is perfectly clear uh, just from reading these tables, uh, but it works well enough in conjunction with having the grid view uh, to come back to and visualize uh, what the test case result is like. Uh, so another analysis we can do is to find the origin of a regression. If we're interested in history for the particular test case, uh, we can turn off the filtering uh, and just examine every change in chronological order. Uh, and that's just a straightforward modification of the uh, algorithm described on the earlier slides. And another analysis that uh, projects might find interesting is to use the collected data in the repository to identify flaky or non-deterministic test cases. Uh, so in our case, uh, it's happened often enough that uh, the build bots test the same commit more than once for one reason or another, uh, that I have enough data uh, to do this without having to do repeated testing additionally. Uh, so out of several thousand um, commits at this, so out of a few thousand commits at this point, well, not a few thousand, out of a few hundred commits at this point, there's around 300 uh, where I have duplicate test results and I can use those to identify non-determinism in test cases. Uh, so here, the basic algorithm is that for each combination of commit and configuration, we find any, we check whether it was multiply tested and if it was, we check whether uh, each instance of that test case produces the same, uh, whether each instance of that test case produces the same set of failures or if there's a difference. And if there is a difference, then we straightforwardly flag it as non-deterministic. But it's actually not that much complexity to this analysis once you have the data all in one place. And Let's see. Yeah, so I hoped to share my screen at the end to show that particular script, but I'm not sure in terms of time constraints. Uh, I'll give my conclusion briefly. Uh, so having the historical data uh, lets us have some clarity about the state of the test suite. If we're just looking at the latest two sets of test results, uh, then we don't know which failures have been in the test suite a long time and were just overlooked due to lack of developer resources and which failures are recent and which failures are important and which ones are unimportant. Uh, the toolkit I have uh, works well enough for our purposes. There's quite a bit of development work. Uh, I'm planning to make it more adaptable to other projects. Uh, we have some interest from uh, GDB developers in terms of adopting it. And I've listed on the slides some ideas on things I'm planning to improve. Uh, in terms of projects I'm aware of and what their testing situation is, uh, for System Tap we have, uh, and GDB we have working parsers for getting data into Bunsen repository. Uh, our continuous integration for System Tap is active and there used to be a, a very solid continuous integration build bot for GDB, uh, but due to maintenance degradation, it's gone uh, defunct at this point. And the archives from that are, uh, I mean, about from, from about a year ago. Uh, for glibc, I'm aware that the project is currently setting up a CI system. Uh, I don't have a parser for glibc logs yet. Uh, and I've put a link to the glibc project's description of their uh, CI system. It's definitely a system that's focused on solving the uh, patch firehose problem first. Uh, for GCC, uh, as I mentioned, GCC has a much more disciplined test suite, uh, which doesn't immediately benefit from this type of analysis. Uh, but it is, is worth noting that uh, the Jenkins server 
uh, is active and well maintained and produces a large firehose of data. Uh, so in terms of where I'm planning to focus my efforts, uh, it's going to be to keep improving the uh, analysis I can do for system tap and to support the GDB people in applying Bunsen to their project. Uh, for working with other CI systems, I would need to figure out a set of best practices for how to extract data from a continuous integration server on an ongoing basis. Uh, that doesn't require uh, as much maintenance as it currently does. And in terms of that, uh, that's pretty much it for my talk. Uh, I've listed some links on this final slide. And uh, thank you for your attention and apologies for the unexpected sound difficulties. Yeah, hi. thank you very much indeed for that. Um, uh, very useful talk. Um, any questions or comments from the community? Minister? Yeah, it's worth noting that I'm also uh, having no luck with the matrix chat. So either okay. people could raise hands or... Uh... Jose. Hi, Sergey. Um, what is the what is the user interface for this? I mean, I mean, imagine that we set up um, for GCC.git, for example. We have a continuous integration that runs tests like every week or every couple of days or every day, mm -hmm. and then um, it creates a repository with the historical data. Now, how will that help me, for example, to bisect? Uh, a problem for mm. which I have a test identified as the one that is uh, failing. So currently for system tap, we do all the testing internally. So we have two ways of accessing the data. Uh, the first is a very rudimentary CGI server, uh, which you put in a URL and it uh, runs the script and returns the analysis results similarly to what I showed on the slide earlier. Uh, and the other option for accessing it is logging into the machine and running a Python script to get that result. Uh, so probably the most robust solution is for these grid views, which are actually uh, global to the test suite. Uh, so you don't need to uh, select a specialized query. Uh, these would probably make sense to generate statically and put somewhere on a web server just as HTML files. Uh, so I'll probably develop more sophisticated uh, web interfaces at some point because I've had some good suggestions from uh, Keith sites on how to do that. Uh, but I'm keen to preserve the ability to generate static HTML files and just have a batch job uh, generate those and put them somewhere. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Jose. Um, a question from uh, Aaron Sordi. Are those slides posted somewhere? Um, so um, if nothing else, they will appear in due course, I hope, um, via the uh, GCC wiki. That should be by link into um, LPC's uh, infrastructure. But shortly after this conference, they will appear. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah, I'm not sure. I think you, we've already got your talk, your slides. Uh, but if you haven't mm -hmm. sent them to Sarah, please do, um, and we'll make sure one way or another the slides are made available. Yeah. So okay. the copy I'm presenting yeah. from now is the one I sent. So uh, yes, I believe you have them. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have a 15-minute break now, and then we'll come back um, uh, after the uh, uh, break with a uh, talk on dwarf extensions uh, from Tony Ty and Zoran Zaric. Um, the second session of today will, I hope, be chaired by uh, Joel Brobecker, who I'm sure is about to join us on here and will take over the chair for you. Uh, so thank you very much to all our speakers for this first section and getting us off to a flying start. And uh, I'll be back with you all in just under 15 minutes. Thank you.